war, famine, pestilence, and disease. The four horsemen of the apocalypse are riding hard across Gaza even as we speak. In the last few minutes, an horrific massacre has taken place at Rafa, a little town I know well, the border between Gaza and Egypt, almost always locked on the orders of Israel and complied with by, well, a compliant Egyptian government. If it were not compliant, it wouldn't be the government, if you get my drift. A huge number of Palestinians are sleeping out in the streets of Rafa. I'm talking scores of thousands of families lying out on the cold earth in this January weather. And yet another massacre has now been visited upon them. If we get more news pictures of that, we will, of course, bring them to you. About the World Food Programme has just warned that uh, five-sixths, five-sixths, of all the people in the world suffering acute food shortage this day are in Gaza. Famine is being deliberately engendered as a weapon of war. Disease is spreading so fast that even the Israeli invasion force has begun to catch it. All kinds of exotic fungal diseases that they have never seen or experienced before are being caught even by the invaders. Imagine what the emaciated, hungry, cold, and homeless Palestinian people are now host to. In fact, an epidemic is exactly what Israel is hoping for. That's why they destroyed the water supply after they cut it off in the first hours of the post-October 7th invasion. They deliberately destroyed the health system, deliberately disabling effectively all of Gaza's hospitals. A people of 2.3 million are now being bombed in a tiny cage in which there are no effective hospitals left. The power, of course, has gone. The water supply has gone, and the deliberate targeting of the sewage system is all about trying to fan the flames of epidemic on top of the flames of ceaseless bombardment by the world's most terrifying and expensive weaponry given gratis to Netanyahu by Joe Biden, about whom much more later. War famine, pestilence, disease are all now taking a grip of the vulnerable, the children in particular, in the Gaza Strip. But the war goes on. The Israeli invasion force is being contested every step of the way. And all that we are able to see from the Palestinian side, because, well, frankly, it's so bad you don't see much from the Israeli side. The war is not going well for the invaders. I'll be asking one of the country's most eminent experts, uh, Dr. Andreas Krieg, later in the show, about exactly why Israel has redeployed thousands of its soldiers out of the north of the Gaza Strip, having paid dearly in blood their own blood as well as, of course, a very much larger amount of Palestinian blood to occupy in the first place. In Jerusalem, uh, the Armenian Christian community came under mass assault on Christmas Day. Yes, on Christmas Day by masked settlers. We assumed they were settlers. They could have been soldiers who are attempting to seize Armenian Christian property in the old city of Jerusalem. A timeless battle has been going on all of the 50 years I've been involved in this cause of Palestine. 
interested in the Israel-Palestine conflict with a very clear side, of course, but interested in the Armenian and the broader Christian population in Jerusalem. And in that 50 years, more and more of the Christian population in the old city of Jerusalem have been extirpated, have been ethnically cleansed and driven out. And that continues even on Christmas Day. The West Bank has become, well, a carnage. It has actually seen a gigantic expansion in the activities of settlers and soldiers, usually working openly and visibly in tandem with each other, as more land is seized for what Israel itself, the state itself, has described as an industrial level of new settlements in the Palestinian territories designated by the Oslo Agreement, which your government signed up to, your government, my government, all governments signed up to a Palestinian state in the West Bank, which is being concreted by Israeli settlement expanded on an industrial level. Hundreds, I think 325 was the last figure I saw. 325 Palestinians have been murdered, murdered in the West Bank where there is no Hamas, where the, how shall I put it, Western ally, President Abbas is nominally in charge. But the Israeli forces sweep in and murder people. They seize homes. They demolish homes. They seize settlements and begin constructing upon them. It's no happy new year in Beirut, where Sheikh Hassan Nasrallah, Said Hassan Nasrallah, the leader of the party of God, Hezbollah, has just spoken. Uh, live in, again, the last few minutes. The egregious, criminal, cross-border assassination by Israel of one of the leaders of Hamas living there in the center of Beirut, from which, incidentally, reportedly, he was the point man for the facilitating of the release of Israeli hostages being held in Gaza. He was the point man uh, between Israel and the Hamas top leaders living in Qatar. So they clearly have decided to go for broke in every way by killing the man that was helping to get their hostages released. They clearly have abandoned their hostages. Well, we kind of knew that when they gunned down their own hostages, naked, carrying a white flag, speaking in Hebrew, with red hair and red beard. We kind of knew they didn't care about their hostages when they murdered them in Gaza after a group of them had escaped. But by killing Aruri, uh, the deputy in Hamas, the man responsible for hostage negotiations, they have clearly signed a death warrant for their own hostages, their own Israeli citizens. But that too should not be surprising, as more and more evidence, testimony emerges about just how many of the people killed on October 7, in Israel were in fact killed by Israel, by its armed forces, its helicopter gunships, its tanks, its gunners, artillery, and infantry soldiers are now appearing almost daily on Israeli television to say how traumatized, horrified they are because they were ordered by their officers 
to effectively massacre their own citizens under what's called the Hannibal Directive, by which Netanyahu decrees that no Israeli must be taken prisoner. They should be killed rather than allowed to become prisoners, precisely because of the political leverage that taking prisoners gave the otherwise hopelessly outgunned Palestinian resistance fighters. More of that with considerable experts in the region later. The killing of Aruri is, of course, an international crime. Lebanon has the right to defend itself. It has the right to retaliate. Lebanon, if it were to launch an attack on Tel Aviv this evening, would be acting entirely lawfully. Uh, but the Israelis count on the fact that that will not happen. They may be counting rather complacently, as the number of their crimes against neighboring countries intensifies and multiplies. I've no idea who Aruri was. I'd never heard of him before. I've no idea uh, how important he was to Hamas. But however important, I know that he will have been replaced before his body was placed in the ground. It is abundantly clear from all the other people that Israel has assassinated that these assassinations achieve absolutely nothing. Sheikh Yassin the founder of Hamas, was assassinated. His successor, Rantisi, was assassinated. Yasser Arafat was assassinated. Abu Ali Mustafa was assassinated. Did that end Israel's problems? Did that mean that the Palestinian resistance forces, factions, ran out of new leaders? That the people lost heart? and abandoned their struggle. Of course, the very opposite is true. By the way, in every single one of those assassinations I just adumbrated, the guy who came next was more of a problem for Israel than the devil that they knew, something I warned many times when I said, deal with President Arafat, make an agreement with President Arafat, because after President Arafat comes the deluge, and all of that came to pass. But the mother of Aruri in Beirut was, of course, coming hard on the heels of the murder of an Israeli general, uh, sorry, a Iranian general in Damascus. Israel murdered him too. A second attack on a neighboring sovereign country, member state of the United Nations. They openly murdered this Iranian general who was advising uh, the Syrian armed forces in Damascus when he was murdered. Now, they hope, <coughs> maybe believe, that Syria, that Lebanon, for fear of triggering the wider war, which Israel clearly wants, will not retaliate or will bide their time before retaliation. Uh, it may be hoped in Western capitals that this will be so, that Hezbollah will allow itself to be humiliated, reduced to making fiery speeches with no real fire, at least commensurate with the crime that has been committed against them. Uh, this man was murdered whilst a guest of Hezbollah. Anybody who knows anything about Arab and Islamic culture knows that that's a very, very serious problem for the armor proper, for the honor of an Islamic resistance movement. Nasrallah didn't give much away this evening, except to say 
of that revenge will be swift and it will be severe. We'll see and keep that under review here on the mother of all talk shows. But the crime that was committed in Iran today is equally clearly designed uh, to bring about the wider war, which is the only kind of war uh, that Israel can hope to prevail within, can hope to gain any advantage from. After all, the current war on the, in the north against Hezbollah and in the Gaza Strip is costing them an arm and a leg, literally and metaphorically. A huge numbers of their soldiers are being killed and wounded, maimed in that conflict. But it's also costing their economy. An economy never all that robust, entirely dependent on American private and public subvention to fund the lifestyle that they have, which is far better than the lifestyle enjoyed by your average American taxpayer, by the way. Israel has all the things American citizens don't have, like free health care, like free university education, all paid for by you, you mugs, down on Main Street in Peoria and in Philadelphia. You mugs are funding a lifestyle on the Mediterranean for 7 million people, which uh, leaves if I may put it this way, your own lifestyle in the shade. But all of that is imperiled as the cost to the Israeli economy of this particular war is beginning to be counted by the markets and by the credit markets in particular. But what happened today in Kerman, in Iran, could scarcely be of more grave consequence and potential for that wider war that Israel wants, that Iran and Hezbollah have been trying to avoid. The uh, general, Hajj Soleimani, as a shrine. This is the fourth anniversary of his murder by Donald Trump. An egregious murder of a man who had done more to destroy ISIS in the region than any number of armies of the so-called Western allies that purported, at least, to wish the end of ISIS. Soleimani brought about the end of ISIS. He was the hammer of ISIS. So Donald Trump murdered him four years ago. Today, tens of thousands of people flocked to his shrine in the city of Kerman, his hometown, in order to pay tribute uh, to a national and Islamic hero. For them, he is of entirely heroic capacities. And somebody blew up two IEDs in amongst the crowd and has murdered hundreds of Iranian citizens there for the commemoration of the murder of the national hero. The death toll is rising by the hour. The last one I saw was now well over 200 dead and well over 500 seriously wounded. The local hospital has become entirely overwhelmed. Now, who carried out that crime? Well, I'm no Inspector Poirot, but Jacques Hughes, Benjamin Netanyahu, and Joe Biden. I'll be right back after a short break with two of the very best guests you have ever seen. 